Good morning, Largo Medical Center. Good morning, Christine, Janet, Teresa. Hello, Hello Largo Medical Center. Okay, we're going to go ahead and get started today, and uh, we're not talking about cardio-oncology. We just have a case, and we have several vignettes to present to you today. And so uh, we would start with this one, uh, because cardio-oncology is always important because it's about congestive heart failure. And so since Kara Shearer is pretty invested in congestive heart failure, I thought we'd start out with this. We have another congestive heart failure case to show you. And then some of the coronary CTA cases that came in the emergency room. And then we're going to talk a little bit about uh, patients who are high risk who come in for pre-op evaluation and then we usher them through some kind of non-cardiac surgery. In this case, pelvic floor and orthopedic. So let's start with a cardio-oncology case just to get warmed up. We have a lady that uh, first presented to us at age 35. Uh, she's a Caucasian married female from Lund, Sweden. She has a history of breast cancer at age 31 when she was six and a half months pregnant. She noticed some redness of her right breast. Uh, her doctor said it was mastitis, put her on an antibiotic. She uh, basically went to see another doctor who was involved in breast cancer as a breast cancer surgeon. We did a biopsy and said you have breast cancer and it looked like uh, that uh, this was going to be uh, a very difficult course because she still had labor and delivery ahead of her and uh, she did get uh, Adrian Meissen course and then uh, surgery and then radiation and then reconstruction and then she was found to have a new left lower lobe lung tumor and received uh, chemotherapy treatment for that and so she is an adriamycin exposure patient as well as Herceptin as well as the combination of Herceptin Progetta which the FDA basically mandated every six week echo for this combination. The other adriamycin we usually do every three months. We also follow biomarkers such as NT Pro BNP and also troponin. Uh, so this patient had been followed by other doctors and different echo machines, different techs, and different doctors gave different ejection fractions. And so she was very confused by all the numbers of her ejection fraction and how they would follow it from ejection fraction to ejection fraction and that the ejection fraction was cast in stone and was extremely important. Every time there was a different ejection fraction, there'd be a big reaction as to it either going up or going down but it involved a different machine, different technician, and different doctor, and there was no standardization. So that's, that's a problem when you keep dancing around to echo machines and doctors. And uh, you have to have the same tech, the same doctor, the same machine, and then you can have some standardization, especially for strain in that there are several vendor packages which have different normals. And so it looked like her average was about 40%. And uh, she was treated with lenalapril but had to stop because of cough. At this age, uh, women are very sensitive to their looks, and she was losing some hair. She had fatigue. She had two little kids now, insomnia, and uh, she stopped all cardiac meds, was very frustrated, refused beta blockers and ACEs. And we watched her ejection fraction go from 37% to 23%. We checked it by CMR, which is the gold standard cardiac MR, showed an ejection fraction of 42% and dropped to 32%. So at least a 10% drop at the least, maybe more, 14%. And then the echo strain was minus 13%. We didn't have a baseline for that. And so because a lot of people don't do echo strain, I find it extremely useful after four years of struggling to try to reproduce the data, to try to have something that correlated with, like an anchor, and to, to make sense out of it. After four years, strain is finally making some sense and helps us with patients. So now, what is the plan? We've had this exploration of beta blockers, ACEs, haven't gone to the ARBs yet, 
and we've got ejection fraction that's dropped. She hasn't been on um, aldosterone inhibitors, pyronolactone, clarinone, and so here we are. What are we going to do now? And here's a lady that's very difficult to work with uh, because she just doesn't tolerate these drug complications. She's got little kids to watch. She's got a business to run. She's got a husband to look after. All kinds of she's moving. She's got so much stuff going on. And so we took a drug holiday with her, and this is what happened. 23% ejection fraction by echo, which is usually the most convenient, and certainly an abnormal strain, although we don't have a baseline of minus 13%. And so we discussed this conference, this uh, patient at one of our cardio-oncology conference, conferences, and didn't have any experience at all with the new drug, Entresto. But we decided, let's give it a try and uh, see if that drug will help. There's no support at all in the literature in cardio-oncology. Uh, certainly there's a very, very strong literature for using carvedilol. There's a strong literature for using ACEs. There is a, almost as strong for using ARBs. And so we did the uh, trial on Tresto, 24, 26, two weeks, increased to 49.51, two weeks, didn't go up to the higher dose because her blood pressure would go down to 80, but run about 100 systolic without symptoms. Repeat her ACO in six months, and of course all this time she's had symptoms of her medications, but not symptoms of congestive heart failure. She's had no abnormalities of her NT pro BNP, and her troponin uh, has not been abnormal. So we got an injection fraction now of 55% with the machine doing the calculations, which is almost, you know, double, almost blinded, certainly double blind, almost randomized using uh, letting the machine do it instead of our making decisions. And then the strain came up from minus 13 to minus 18. So that's normal. So that really clinches it. And so uh, this was a happy experience uh, that we had that we wanted to show you with Entresto, with one of our cardio-oncology cardio patients. There's no literature at all about Entresto in cardio-oncology. And so uh, we should talk about this and write it up. We do have a case report journal uh, called Onc Review that would publish this because they're interested in individual cases. And uh, they've been sort of tailored for that by Medline to specialize in cardio-oncology. So that's a Polish medical journal, of which I'm a deputy editor, which means I can't do my Polish jokes anymore. It's unfortunate. But let's go on and look at some other slides, and we'll tell you some more about someone else. So hang on, please. And we'll close this little deck down. And since we've been talking about congestive heart failure. Let's get a congestive heart failure patient on board, another patient with congestive heart failure, and see what you think about this lady. She is also complicated, 88-year-old lady, so it's complicated already because you've got an uh, elderly lady who is a Caucasian white widow female first seen by me in 2011, has been followed by Dr. Sharamquist for at least 10 years, and had a history of coronary disease for about 11 years with seven right coronary stents, recurrent episodes and encounters, an old inferior wall mod that's inferior basilar, with some remodeling with some microgurgitation that started out as one plus when I took over this patient for Dr. Sharamquist when he went to the VA. But then, uh, it's gotten to be three plus, left atrial enlargement, pulmonary hypertension, RV systolic pressure of 45, and a dilated aorta for a little lady. And so she had known paroxysmal atrial fibrillation with uh, Dr. Stromquist sending her over here for multiple TEs. Cardioversion finally evolved into persistent atrial fibrillation since we didn't do an ablation with Chaz Vask 3. Ejection fraction well preserved at 60%, but mild pulmonary hypertension. She was true to beta pace to try to keep her back in the rhythm, but it was impossible, and so she wound up on a different beta blocker and chronic atrial fibrillation. 
hypertension, lisinopril, Coumadin, Plavix, Lasix, and a statin drug, Lasix 80 for years. And so you can see that certainly I'd be somebody to get her off of Coumadin since uh, I'm much more interested in using the non-conventional NOAC, so to speak. And so I went to a NOAC, Eliquis. Uh, also, you would think I'd be using Renexa if I thought there was some ischemia. But we did do an MRI, and we found the old posterior basilar infarct by late gadolinium enhancement, but we didn't see any ischemia there. And we were looking for ischemia because we said, hey, we could just, if the right's closed down or the circumflex closed down, it's going to ischemic muscle, we can just open it up, relieve the ischemia. There will be some remodeling of the mitral annulus, and the patient will get better. And we've got a bunch of those. Unfortunately, she didn't fit that mode. We said, uh-oh, now we've really got troubles. And she is on a spironolactone, aldosterone inhibiting type drug. And so we've got the waterfront covered. Uh, she's also on lisinopril. And so what do we do now? I don't have anybody to ask where to do now because uh, I don't think I have anybody that uh, I can talk to. And so with that in mind, uh, I'll just have to tell you what we did. So here's an 88-year-old lady who's settling into mitral regurgitation that uh, is getting uncomfortable and uh, who you really don't want to go put a clip in if it's clippable. You certainly don't want to do a repair or replacement uh, because she's fragile. And so we will show you someone that we decided was not as fragile as this that uh, we're sending for mitral valve repair. Uh, but we're trying to get an edge and so she'll have mitral valve repair. It's an 86-year-old lady we have is going to get mitral valve repair by Didier LeMay at New York University using robotic surgery. It gives a big edge because it's three days out of the hospital with most people. So we decided not to do that on this lady. Didn't think she was a good candidate. But we did say, well, let's start her on Entresto. The low dose was all she could tolerate. And we did do that in September. And our real surprise was follow up in Christmas before uh, her Christmas time. And she said, New York class one, best in years, able to do more than ever, spent Christmas Eve and day with her daughter. And so this was a real bonus for me at Christmas time. You get this lady, my regurgitation, to class one, congestive heart failure in New York, New York Heart Association. So I was very pleased with this. So I like to, to share with the Care Assure group. Uh, some experiences with congestive heart failure because that's their focus. So we're going to show you someone else now. And uh, we'll show you some of the ER in and outs. And as you know, I'm a big proponent of evaluation of patients in the ER with cardiac CT. And we're implementing this co-triage program to do this. And so what is so superior about cardiac CT? Well, we get the anatomy and we also get flow. And we also can do a CT MPI for myocardial perfusion imaging. So we can get a lot of information off the CT. So anatomy, flow, CT, MPI, all that stuff is extremely useful. It's been shown in Denmark there's 50 percent reduction in heart attacks just by doing this instead of stress tests because you put patients in, um, you can put them in buckets and define them by group. And so you've got people that are normal, they're out of there, you're not going to treat them. You've got people with focal coronary calcifications that aren't going to result in anything because there's no necrotic core, so we're not concerned about them. And then we've got people who've got big juicy necrotic cores and juicy plaques. They're at high risk of having a cardiac event. So we'll do a cardiac CT in the drop of a hat. Somebody just shows up in the ER and they uh, ask us to see them. That's uh, certainly a big way of solving the problem of does this patient have coronary artery disease. So this is a guy who shows up who uh, is a married male in his 70s with shortness of breath at rest and new onset night sweats. So it was coming up on Christmas, a doctor sends him over to the emergency room EKG, tropes, BNP, D-dimer negative, echo okay. Strain's not available because they don't do it in the hospital, although we do strain uh, in the office on every case. 
because that's the only way you're ever going to learn how to use it. And so at this point, time for a cardiac CT. The doctor sent the patient over, was expecting a cardiac CT because that's our modus operandi. And actually this patient's brother-in-law had, had a cardiac CT and had a, sort of a juicy plaque. So they knew the expectation. And so voila, here we are on cardiac CT. And uh, this is the left anterior descending, which is the Interstate 4. Uh, and hopefully not such a slowdown as the Interstate 4, but the Interstate 4 highway of uh, the heart. And you see a coronary calcification here. That looks like a big old hunk. Like it could be uh, as it looms into your vision, you know, like an asteroid, a big old rock. But it turns out that there's beam hardening and there's blooming artifact, and it's actually not as big as it looks. And so this is discounted immediately because when you do the cardiac cath, you're not going to see much at all. You're not going, to, not going to be disappointed either. And so down in here is a severe lesion. We toyed with that quite a while and measured some stuff and figured that uh, because of the monomyocardium subtended and uh, the decrease in diameter of this vessel uh, and the second lesion, both of them being in series, that this would account for a significant uh, decrease in FFR. And there are ways of actually computing that and showing that FFR measurement based on FMM, which is functional myocardial mass over minimal luminal diameter. There are several techniques, uh, by one by Ko, K-O, who's in Australia, who uh, has a compilation from Calgary of how much muscle is subtended by how much of a coronary artery, whether it's a small, medium, or large left anterior descending, you can go to a table from Calgary and you can look up exactly how much muscle is subtended and come up with some calculations and uh, actually estimate the FFR based on that. There's some information from a group in Calgary who compared CT lesions to the amount of uh, myocardial mass that's subtended. You just look it up on a table and plug it into an equation. And in 100 seconds, you've got the results. So that's the poor man's FFR. There's also an FFR by Dr. Kim. That's functional myocardial mass that we use. And if I can figure out this mass that's subtended by these two layers two lesions in series, which two in series is much more effective at limiting coronary blood flow than one alone. If I can, if I can figure that out, uh, then that will give me another FFR, and I can use the information uh, from Dr. Kim in uh, South Korea, who basically does the minimal luminal diameter, and then does an allometric method of uh, fractal uh, calculating the branching of the coronary arteries and how much muscle it subtends. So he's got another way of doing that. And I've got a way of doing it too, and unfortunately it takes time. But you basically segment the amount of muscle supplied by this by just going over here and getting into a 3D mode and then looking at 2D of the 3D and then circling the myocardium that's supplied by this artery and its branches and then muscle, measure, measuring that muscle mass after you eliminate the contrast that's in the cavity. And so we can do that too. It just takes some time, unfortunately. But with a supercomputer, we'll be able to do segmentation. And we're going to be working with Watson of IBM soon, and we'll be using their supercomputer. So that'll give us the opportunity for us to compute our own poor man's FFRs. So we think this is a limiting flow. Let's look and see what we can find out. Well, you can uh, be a MacGyver about this and try to uh, get some stuff that was never meant for doing uh, calculations of myocardial blood flow. And so you can see that I'm using the calcium scoring uh, technology and software to basically score in the myocardium the amount of contrast, you can see very easily that uh, the red is very confluent, almost like pools of iodine in the myocardium. 
whereas the green is very sketchy. And so we can actually quantify this on one 2D segment, or we can take multiple 2D segments and add it up as we go using the calcium score and uh, quantify again the distribution in the left anterior ascending territory of iodine comparing to the distribution of iodine in perhaps the right or the circumflex territory. So this is a, another poor man's approach to myocardial blood flow. We're looking at the contrast distribution in the myocardium that's subtending a lesion, two lesions actually in series in the left anterior descending. And we're coming up with information that says it is flow limiting. It is flow limiting. This is all I need to be able to tell that. All I need is uh, to have acquired the images for CT and then uh, to apply calcium scoring technology to come up with some answers. So that's cool. And so this is a way of looking at that data, uh, processing it with what's considered normal epicardial, normal endocardial distribution of sodium iodine, and then comparing that to other segments that have abnormal distribution of sodium iodine uh, uh, contrast. And so here we are with uh, some kind of proportion that's set up uh, by the computer software to get some idea of what's going on. So we got the apex, decrease iodine in the apex, decrease iodine in the septum, and then some decrease iodine in the inferior wall. And I didn't tell you, but the left anterior descending supplies a significant posterior descending to the inferior wall, supplying a lot of the inferior wall, not really basal, more like apical and mid. Uh, so this distribution's a little bit off, but it does supply inferior wall. And I'm not sure how this is calculated. Uh, so it could be off, and I don't think that's uh, a severe disqualifier for this area not getting enough contrast. And certainly you would think the most distal segment would not get enough contrast, which is the distal LED, some of the distal septum, and the inferior walls you see. Well, what is this for? This is just showing you myocardium. That didn't tell me anything. Well, it does. It tells you that we don't have fatty replacement we don't have calcium replacement, and we don't have thinning. So there's no old inferior wall MI. Because if I'm going to do a stress-only image, well, what do you mean by stress? Well, it's usually post-nitroglycerin for vasal dilatation, uh, get hyperemic flow, and also post-contrast to get hyperemic flow. And then uh, also patients usually are on a beta blocker to limit their heart rate which attenuates ischemia, but altogether, you know, we're doing sort of a stress-only test. So how are we going to know if there's a fixed defect? Well, we'll know that inferior wall is intact by looking through the sections of uh, this heart. The anterior wall is intact, or the LED lesion is, by looking through these segments. And so these segments look fine. So we don't uh, have to do a stress-rest study with this kind of information. So let's look on. And so looking at this right now, uh, these are our lesions that I showed you. And now obviously this patient is troponin negative, BNP negative, but very symptomatic and has two lesions in series with decreased blood flow and abnormal FFR. We were calculated by our estimates uh, on CT scan without sending it to Palo Alto to be post-processed by heart flow, you can see the alignment of these two vessels and it looks very much the same, very much the same here and very much the same down here. So um, amazing the correlation of the CT. But the one correlation that's not there is this big asteroid of calcification. It looks just so huge you know, that's red as a 50% blockage by a lot of imagers. That really is nothing. It's just uh, what we call blooming artifact. Sounds like a blooming uh, onion. Uh, sounds like a, something from out back. Blooming artifact. But anyway, comparing that to this, 
you know, uh, I don't see, this is the stenosis, this is the calcification, this is where the branch comes off. So I go upstream looking for that. There's some foreshortening over here. I don't see it. And so that's frequently the case. Something that we think is a big hunk of calcium hanging in a proximal vessel and we get in a tizzy about it turns out uh, to be very much nothing when you do the cardiac cath and discredits us. So if we got a big piece of calcium like that and we want to know if it's significant. Usually it's not and we guess the wrong way. We guess by an act of commission. We should guess by an act of omission and say, hey, that's nothing but blooming artifact. It's probably just a streak in the coronary if you look at the CT. It's like looking at a fish underwater. It looks much bigger because it's distorted by the water and there's some refraction. Well, also looking at this calcium with CT is distorted and makes it bloom and look bigger than it actually is. So very good parallels of these two arteries side by side in this way. And so this is the final result. And the final result looks very good. Looks like we got good results of a cardiac cath with uh, stenting by design in that we requested that the stents be put in that, those two areas in series with no other abnormalities. So let's go show some more things for you in our show and tell episodes here. And so we have, likewise, somebody else presents in the ER. And it's always this way. The first presentation was extremely benign. You know, a little shortness of breath, at rest. I don't know what's going on. A lot of people sigh. And then uh, some night sweats, you know, no big deal. Night sweats, sleep apnea, tuberculosis, atelectasis, many things. And so the one that we didn't suspect had coronary artery disease, had two lesions in series. So here's another gentleman who shows up, previous stenting in the right coronary artery, shortness of breath at rest, very similar. But this one has some um, jaw pain on exertion and a block. So you say, well, this guy's got coronary artery disease. Oh, we know he has that. We'll say he's got a significant lesion, exertional jaw pain. Wants to know if he can go on a cruise tomorrow. We're seeing him today. And so prior standing in the right. Well, actually, we looked at the right and found a severe lesion and then follow it for a year. And then finally, he started getting symptoms. And so then we put a stent in it. He's done fine since that time. He said we had a couple encounters or we checked him out and haven't found anything. So this is the first time he's had the appearance of a classical angina pattern uh, since he's been stented. So this was very concerned. And we have no positive markers here. Uh, we did do an echocardiogram. We don't do echo strain, so it's unfortunate because that's what we need. Uh, but the wall motion looked good, and there was no problem with that. No strain, though. So let's see what happened to this guy. And so obviously we're going to do the CT again. And looks pretty good. This is that little ramus intermedius that splits between the circumflex and the LED. And it's got some calcium in it and stuff. And, uh, but I don't think any of this is significant. And uh, that's not a significant measurement there because we're measuring calcium that gives you blooming artifacts. The left anterior descending superhighway, this gentleman, Interstate 4, where he's got some coronary calcifications. But the coronary calcifications uh, are not circumferential. And you can see there's dye getting by pretty fine. So I didn't find any lesions of interest or concern there. And then circumflex, non-obstructive plaques, you can see how that looks pretty good too. And more of the circumflex, looking at the non-obstructive calcified plaque. There is an area of opacity you can't see in. You really have to say, hey, I'm not sure if there's a lesion there. But of course, we can go look at the amount of myocardium that's subtended. It wasn't very helpful. There's some phase boundary artifact that was seen in the coronal views, and so we couldn't use that. We always look for artifact first. Here's the right coronary, and there it's a stent in the right coronary. And... Uh, We've got some coronary calcification, but that's about it. So we look for pulmonary emboli. Let's go see if there's any PE. 
So it's time to look for that. So we know he's had some lymphoma and been treated for that in the past. So looking for a pulmonary emboli, uh, they have eluded me. And so we looked at the dissection of aortic aneurysm, triple rule out. Didn't see anything there. So we sent him on his cruise and we were happy and felt confident that he would do well and that he doesn't have significant coronary disease at this point. So let's close this one up and we'll bring you another one. And so going from the vignettes to uh, something that's a little more uh, important than a vignette and that is perioperative cardiology for two subspecialty programs that we brought to what we're trying to develop as a boutique hospital here in South Tampa because South Tampa is a discretionary income uh, couple of post office zones and so uh, we're trying to match our London hospitals of which we have six. There's a Princess Grace and London Bridge and Portland Hospital. There's a great Armin Hospital or Harley Street Hospital and so forth. Those hospitals are for the wealthy and royalty and people from out of town, international travelers. And so it's pretty neat. So we're trying to sort of segue Memorial Hospital into being a boutique hospital by supplying superb equipment, superb facilities, operating room for doctors who can't get on a good operating room schedule in another hospital. And so these two services have recently become extremely active here and have evolved. And so let's look at these two surgery, uh, surgery specific surgeries and the pitfalls with cardiac patients and what we need to do. So the cardiac patient is actually the same demographics as these people, ladies with pelvic floor significant problems, and uh, a lot of guys and some ladies who blown out a knee and their cartilage on cartilage or blown out a hip and their cartilage on cartilage. Let's take a look. So let's look at some of the patients we've had. So we're talking about seniors. We're talking about the same demographic group. We're talking about people who have stents, hypertension, may be over-treated, may have hypotension, they have paroxysmal atrial fibrillation, clotting and bleeding disorders, pacers, ventricular tachycardia, all such patients. So we had a patient uh, about 10 years ago who had uh, coronary disease, was on Plavix at the time. They stopped the Plavix for five days. It came in came out of surgery and was bleeding, eventually died of the bleed within his hip. And so that was pretty shocking that uh, this patient didn't survive and that bleeding was the problem and it wasn't recognized. And so we had the same thing happen uh, at Tampa General recently where the bleeding was discovered in the hip in rehab by a uh, patient's primary care doctor unbeknownst to uh, the team either of anesthesia or the team of, of uh, orthopedics. And so we said, what do we need to do about that? And the idea is let's have a concierge service for orthopedics and for pelvic floor as well. And let's do this at Memorial in our new role as a boutique hospital. In other words, the tail's going to wag the dog because in the past we would basically get some of the crumbs falling off the table and they were routine cases who would rather go to Memorial because it's more convenient. Well now Tampa General has become an assembly line and they may be doing 15 cases and your case that has some complicated cardiac issues may be number 12 out of 15. And so it's become an assembly line and uh, lo and behold they can't get personalized care with this particular assembly line, the way it's developed. So we said, well, we've got to look at this ourselves and see, do we want to siphon off the high-risk patients and manage those here at Memorial Hospital where now we can do personalized management? And we said, yes, we do want to do that. And so we've got some hip patients. We've got some shoulder patients. Here's a protein C deficiency. 
We got an antithrombin 3 deficiency in a pelvic floor patient, mitral valve repair, a recent CVA, perhaps uh, some paroxysmal atrial fibrillation. Uh, we've got a patient with ventricular tachycardia and a pacer. He's going to get a knee. Patient for knee and hip has hypertension, paroxysmal atrial fibrillation, bypass surgery, paralyzed right diaphragm, congestive heart failure, and an old anterior wall MI that was rescued with stenting. And here's a pelvic floor patient with hypotension from neurocardiogenic syncope. And the patient was NPO, went last for the surgery, became very hypotensive, and they had a problem. But this time we're not going to have that problem. And then here's another gentleman uh, who has low blood pressure and apical hypertrophy cardiomyopathy, the Japanese model, tunnel left ventricle, and then some hernias and needs to get hernia repair and got repair of his umbilical hernia, which was very effective. But after that repair, they were going to go on and do the other two hernias, which were inguinal, but uh, they got uh, sort of bushwhacked by the fact that he'd be an NPO all night, all day, and had his surgery at 6, so became very dehydrated at that point. And he's got a hypertrophic cardiomyopathy that has limited the amount of diastolic content of the left ventricle uh, because it's filled in the apex and made it impossible for the left ventricle to fill adequately and have a stroke volume that's good. So that's why you got to have potential. We can explain that. So how do we deal with these patients? Let's take an example just to show you how complex it is. We're going to take uh, this gentleman uh, listed number one here. So there are notes here to Watson. And why do we have notes to Watson? Well, we've signed a contract to work with what's called deep learning, uh, or called cognitive computing, or artificial intelligence. Everybody knows Watson because Watson was on Jeopardy and beat the champions, beat the champion chess player. It did not beat the champion Go player. It's another product by another company that uh, upset in Go. That's Go. That's a very popular Chinese game. It's very strategic and has a lot of moves, very little memory stuff. And so it's not like chess. So supercomputing has been used in those ways to show that there's something there that we're doing. and We're developing algorithms and we're actually selecting and making decisions with the supercomputer and then building further algorithms after that understanding. So that's considered learning. And uh, basically, I'm in charge of curating the data that I put in to understand more about more uh, points uh, of precision measurement on plaque so that I can have more correlates. Like if we were dealing with say seven correlates, we could define the Big Dipper, but uh, there are other correlates out there that are very important, and actually those correlates are all the signs of the zodiacs and the North so that North uh, Star that the Big Dipper is pointing to with its handle, and so, I mean, actually it's at the end of the cup it's pointing there, at the end of the cup it's pointing up there to the North Star, and so there's lots of possibilities, and so we need to start understanding this and start dealing with artificial intelligence and medicine because it looks like the, one of the factors that distinguishes better doctors from not so better doctors uh, seems to be what they remember. And an encyclopedic knowledge of data really can't hurt. Uh, pattern recognition of 100,000 patterns really can't hurt. And so if we have a computer doing that for us, we're not so dependent on our individual memories and one person's memory being so much better than another, making that person a better doctor. So we're screening with Watson, and we're going to bring this up from time to time in our slide presentations because that's what we're going to be doing with IBM, and we're going to build a strong database and then sort out more variables to correlate with hopefully coronary plaque and coronary plaque rupture. So here's an example of a gentleman who's going to have his hip replaced. 
and he's sent for pre-op evaluation. He had atrial fibrillation 12 years ago. And uh, in our pre-op evaluation, we stumble across the fact that he's going in and out of atrial fibrillation. Well, that certainly could make or break his experience in the hospital for a hip replacement. Because usually if you go in a hospital for hip replacement and you have paroxysmal atrial fibrillation that hasn't been known about for 12 years, there's all of a sudden stat echo, stat cardiology consult, move to the ICU, and all this stuff goes on, and the patient winds up a prolonged outlier for hospitalization for hip replacement complicated by atrial fibrillation. So if we can evaluate his atrial fibrillation, CHADS vast score him, put him on the appropriate therapy, and then prevent it, we've done a big thing and saved him from being in the hospital for an extra seven days, I would think. And so with that, we certainly did that with Eliquis, Propafenon, Cartizem, and uh, we basically got him out of atrial fibrillation into a normal sinus rhythm and maintained it perioperatively with Propafenon and Cartizem which taking a sip of water and a couple pills before you go to surgery isn't such a bad thing if you're going to avoid the complication of perioperative atrial fibrillation. So in our observations, we also discovered uh, looking for coronary disease. And if you go looking for something, you got to be careful because you might find it. We did find coronary disease, and we had some plaque. I'd like to show you the coronary disease he has. And we have a 63% stenosis by using an analysis package called SurePlaque. That's a vital image component that was designed in 2004 and then sort of abandoned by everyone that I resurrected because of my interest in plaque. People haven't been using this for years. So it's been 12 years out, now 13 years, and nobody's used it. I find it extremely useful. I also find it inhibiting that there's not been any software development uh, on the shoulders of what's already been done. And we see we got some kind of narrowing in here that we've defined as being 63% uh, or so. So here's some calcification. There's some beam hardening, making the calcium look big, uh, blooming artifact. The calcium looking big actually is the blooming artifact, and the black here is beam hardening. So there is some black beam hardening. And then uh, we got little sprinkles of calcium, and then we got this lesion here. So let's look more at this and see what the significance is. And here is a significant information. Blowing this up to be very big and looking at this area, you see we have a ruptured plaque. This is a patient that has an asymptomatic plaque rupture. That happens a lot. You know, people get these little blisters or pimples inside their artery, and it'll rupture. And many times when it ruptures, nothing happens, you know, and it's just going to heal up. Maybe it'll rupture again. Maybe it'll become calcified. Maybe it'll become fibrotic. And so, but it happens all the time that vessels are developing unstable plaque in their rupture. You can see there's a lot of necrotic core in there. You can see over here the percent necrotic core is not so high at the stenosis. The percent at the stenosis looks like it's about 21%. This, but, but the percent, uh, and I'm used to seeing maybe 35% being significant. And so we can measure this and tell you how much total plaque burden there is of uh, necrotic core. So that's what's really important. So ruptured plaque is high risk if somebody's going into surgery for this, especially if there's some reason to think that they're going to have activated platelets. Of course, he, he's been on uh, some antiplatelet drugs, especially I think he's been on some aspirin for a while. So then we found a little lesion also down here in the uh, posterior descending coming off the right, uh, which uh, we graded this as being a 50% PDA. So that's the extent of his coronary disease. And uh, this is the CT MPI showing the most extreme area of decreased blood flow is at the apex. This corresponds to the left anterior descending. The diagonal is sort of over here, so it is the LAD. Doesn't, it's after the septal perforator, so it's more distal. And then this corresponds to some of the PDA that we're critical of. So there's decreased blood 
evidenced by decreased iodine at rest in these two areas, which uh, adds more uh, to the pot here in terms of risk. And so, and we found a correlation between strain, strain echo and uh, coronary CTA MPI. And here's the correlation, and they just don't line up very well, but there is a correlation. So there's a correlation of some abnormality in the lateral wall, some abnormality forward in this anterior wall, distribution of the left anterior descending. So here we are comparing the two, and usually they're a little bit off in terms of comparison. This is pretty close, and actually we can merge the two and show this is falling right on this, which is uh, anterior, Use the LAD, diagonals over here, and this is falling on the PDA. And so we've got two regions we've been able to establish with decreased myocardial perfusion imaging as well as resting strain echo. And so that's the beauty of the strain echo is being able to diagnose this early if we were seeing this gentleman in the emergency room, that's what we'd be able to do. So let's see what happens with hip surgery and knee surgery. So here's a knee replacement. This is a transesophageal echo. I did one of these. I did a transesophageal echo, you know, maybe 20 years ago here at this hospital, a patient who uh, had an LAD lesion, and I needed to monitor that during surgery. So I said, I'll just go up there, put a TE in, and watch it. So while I was doing that, we looked over the right atrium. We see all this stuff going in here. It's amazing this floatsome and jetsum that's coming through the left atrium as we're watching this. And this is not, there are some bubbles in there. This is not a bubble test. This is not a contrast test. This is stuff that's coming from the knee replacement. And so, well, let's look at the hip. And wow, during the hip replacement, we see the same thing. We see a lot of stuff coming in there and uh, don't see it a fate patent frame at this time, but we see a lot of stuff coming through here, and you can see uh, how amazing that is. And actually, the surgeon was very angry about that and said, turn that damn thing off. I can't stand to look at all that stuff. And so that is true. All that stuff is going through there. So let's look at what are our choices now that we know this guy has all that stuff's going to come through the right atrium, right ventricle. Some of it may come across the probe patent foramen, but it's going to activate platelets like wild. The Freeman factor and uh, von Wildebrand surface factor, all this stuff is going to be activated dramatically uh, by this floatsum and jetsum coming into the right atrium. And so what are our choices? Well, our choices are perioperative statins to decrease risk. That decreases inflammation. Pre-op uh, bare metal stent, wait a month for surgery. I don't think he wants to do that. Maximize medical therapy, Plavix is a loading dose, ultra-high dose of statin drugs, aspirin, beta blocker, placogram in a month. That's an alternative. Proceed with surgery, surveillance, then stand of symptoms. Mm, that sounds like something rational. And then at Emory, Dr. Halkos does a robotically harvested LAD off-pump, you know, which would be a nice little thing, an asymptomatic and then probably puts a stent in the diagonal or one of those vessels. So those are, these are the alternatives. And, of course, we have the publications about beta blocker for non-cardiac surgery uh, being beneficial, but uh, all those publications basically being ripped off the market because of uh, some lies by the gentleman who published it and uh, surgery, basically. Uh, Pre-op beta blocker for non-cardiac surgery being uh, not appropriate and actually resulting in harm. So these are our decisions to make. Let's see what we decided to do. And uh, oh, we also want to show some prior experience. What's been our experience in the past when someone comes to the office and we get a baseline and we're following him and all of a sudden he gets a severe episode of chest pain, comes back to see us a couple of days later and uh, Basically, the tests we do are negative. We look at his EKG, no change. We look at his echo. We look at his strain. Look at his BNP and his troponin. Look at his D-dimer. Everything across the board is negative. So now what do we do with all these negatives? And so, um, and this is a patient that we protected with Plavix, high-dose statin, a very aggressive medical treatment. 
and with that he didn't have chest pain anymore and so and he didn't develop an MI so but uh, we have some choices here but this guy's gonna go to surgery and we don't have a lot of time if he just goes to surgery so let's see what we did and uh, we did still have some consideration about inflammatory responses when patients have all this release of stuff fat cement fiber when they have surgery the inflammatory markers and the platelet activations are extremely important and can be measured by some parameters if you want to so there of course you know the problems with plavix when a patient's on plavix you know they have a lot more bleeding and we've been instructed by many orthopedists to stay off the plavix for at least five days before surgery and so post-op right hip platelet activation, debris, right, heart emboli to the pulmonary arteries, and uh, patient uh, developed chest pain after he went home. He was in touch with our navigator. She brought him back to the hospital. He was having a non-STEMI at uh, the plaque site, transferred to Tampa General, her angioplasty and stenting, and uh, here's our area where there uh, appears to be a, uh, an area of erosion, plaque fracture, whatever you want to call it. It's got a big hole in it, an ulcer, ulcerated plaque. And uh, here is compared to coronary angiography. You really don't see that smoother than that, but it is a significant lesion. And so that got stented uh, with good results. And I don't have had the stent. But the important thing was that by recognizing this by the pre-op CT, we were able to switch the patient to Memorial where we see the high-risk patients now. We used to send them to Tampa General. Now they have the low risk. We've switched out and helping engage our open orthopedic heart surgery to understand what we're doing, our orthopedic hip surgeon to understand what we're doing. We implemented special orders for perioperative atrial fibrillation. Our nurse navigator contacted the patient at home, got him back in the hospital when he had chest pain, followed up in my office. She came to see the patient, and the patient is doing well now, and we have more patients we need to treat in this sort of custom may, may way of management. And so that's what we've done. So these are the patients that we wanted to show you today. It's kind of a varied group, and we want to show you some of the programs that we're implementing to be considered a boutique hospital. Thank you very much for your attendance today. I uh, look forward to seeing you next week. I uh, hope everybody has a good new year. Bye-bye.